Hello, my name is Lynn Wilson. I'm thrilled to be able to talk to you today about one of my favorite sections in the Doctrine and Covenants, and it's section 76 on the vision, because there are things here that are so deep and beautiful that it's easy to go for a deep dive. And it's also a section I have many, many questions about. And as we look at the hard questions in church history, I hope that these do not offend you. Um, so many members of the church left when section 76 was given because it offended them. And I hope that we can remain humble and meek for the th changes that come in our generation that are revealed by our prophet, and we can accept them. So section 76, why purport such dramatic change to Christian thought of heaven? <laughs> why does the vision claim to save murderers? Now, these might be not questions for you, but these were questions in the 19th century. Who can become a son of perdition? And why introduce the Holy Spirit of promise in connection with this vision. And I think that's very important because the Holy Spirit of promise is mentioned six times in the Doctrine and Covenants and also in the Bible, seven times total. Actually, I think it's seven in the Doctrine and Covenants, so eight times total. But why are these aspects of the Holy Spirit of promise not talked about now? Why is this something that we always refer to in Joseph's day, but not in our day and age? Let's look a little bit at the time. Sidney was called to be a scribe for the New Biblical Translation in December of 1830. And so he starts in Genesis, but most of his work is in the New Testament because, of course, that changes. They stopped the translation, as you recall, in December. They moved Ohio and then begin again, finished up to Genesis 24, and then switched to the New Testament. And so Sidney's doing that. February 1st, they arrive in Ohio. March 7th is when Joseph and Emma and their four-month-old twins Actually, I have that date wrong. Um, it's September, excuse me, moved down to the Johnson's home. And they have the conference of the church there um, in October and in November. By 1832, on January 26th, Section 75 is given at this church conference in Amherst, Ohio. And then Section 76 is given on February 16th, that cold winter day. The average high was 29 degrees. I looked up some historical records to find that one. And Joseph and Sidney were translating John chapter 5. And a month later, on March 25th, they were tarred and feathered. And some think it was in direct relationship to that record. Four days after his tar and feathering, little Thaddeus Murdoch Smith died from complications from his measles that they think were exasperated because of the exposure during the tar and feathering. April 1st is when the paper is ordered by Newell Whitney, and within the week, within a few days after the death, Joseph leaves his grieving family to go down to Missouri and pick up the paper and deliver it. But while they're on John and um, Elsa Johnson's farm for that year of September, um, they hold a few conferences. In January of 32, which is getting closer to the time that I'm talking about right now, and I'm sorry if this timeline stuff is, is miserable for you. For me, it helps you keep things in, in order and keep them in place, and I hope for you it's not just overwhelming dates. It's easier, I think, if you follow along on the handouts watching my video. They should be listed right below that, and you can click on them. But they went to this Amherst concert conference of the church, which is about a 60 miles northwest, and came right back and that's when they dive back into the revelations in February and have this sweet experience. Now, Sidney had been a scribe already for about 12 months, 11 months in the New Testament. Um, I'm taking out the month they did not translate. And I've mentioned the speed of using a quill multiple times. But think of it in this section where the text says in section 76, verse 19, while we meditated upon these things, you know, you have a lot of time if you're dipping your quill into the ink as Joseph is reading, thinking, praying, and you can see that he changed some things in John chapter five, verse 29, and they shall come forth and they that have done good unto was changed to in the resurrection. Instead of the resurrection of life, he has the resurrection of the just. He's separating out the resurrection of the unjust and the just. He's separating out that there's going to be two resurrections. All this is new information. And he's, he's feeling this, the resurrection of the just. And he's pondering on it. He's meditating. Why did I feel inspired to say that? And they that have done evil change to in the resurrection of, instead of damnation, the unjust. But there's still going to be a resurrection. You know, everyone's going to be saved. There's nothing better than the message of the restoration. It's not just those 
who will be saved, who have been baptized or who have the Bible or who have a belief of God. Everyone will have the opportunity to hear the word of God. The, the, our church has no boundaries on who is going to be too wicked and to fall short of the atonement of Jesus Christ. And Joseph is pondering and meditating on this. And that's where you see the dot. He finishes the word unjust. He has a blot of ink and it appears as if his quill falls or if the ink has been strained right there where this vision opened up to him on February 16th, or opened up to them, both Sydney. And, you know, occasionally, some people do see the same vision at the same time. We have a few accounts of it in the Doctrine and Covenants even. But usually, I'm thinking right now of Nephi's Tree of Life and Lehi's Tree of Life. They're described differently, but they're similar visions. And we're told that they also were similar to John the Revelator, even though they, you can hardly recognize the two of them. But in verse 19 and 20, in section 76, it reads, the Lord touched the eyes of our understanding and they were opened and the glory of the Lord shone round about and we beheld the glory of the Son on the right hand of the Father and he received of his fullness. This is throne theophany. We have these all over the Old Testament and the New Testament as well. In, in section 76, we also have it in Exodus 3 with Moses and Isaiah 6 and Amos and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, in the book of Revelation. You know, there are so many accounts of this and they often have share similarities where the glory of the Lord is described in great beauty. He continues on, while we were yet in the spirit, the Lord commanded us that we should write the vision. And he repeats that in verse 28 and 49 and 80 and 113 and 115. Stop and write it down. You know, stop and write it down. And I think in my own life that I should stop sometime during prayers and write things down. I, I love this reminder for me um, when thoughts come into your mind and you don't even know if it's the spirit or not the spirit as you're going about your daily life, write them down and work on them and see if it is the spirit because by their fruits you shall know them. If it's a good thought, act on it. Joseph and Sydney's handwriting, isn't this amazing? So on um, the black and white is Joseph's handwriting. This is the 1832 account of the first vision. That's his handwriting. And then here is Sydney's right over there. Here's a letter from Sydney, just to show you as they're writing this down in eight, um, the vision, there's this script. Now, Philo Dibble came into the room for two thirds of the vision, he said. He was there for an hour. The vision was an hour and a half, approximately. I don't know if anybody's um, exact on these things, but he says, I was there for about two thirds of it. And he recorded what he saw. Now, this blows me away. Someone is walking into the translation room. And what's he doing down in John Johnson's farm anyway? He should be up in Kirtland. I mean, the whole thing just baffles me. And then Philo says, there's other men in the room, probably about 12. So I'm wondering if this is taking an expansive time. Perhaps, did Joseph and Sidney say, oh, we've got an hour before a meeting of, the, of some of the elders. Let's do another chapter of translation here, or maybe they'd been working for several hours and the meeting was just going to start and this vision came upon them. And so then as the elders gathered, otherwise I can't imagine Elsa Johnson just having 12 people walking in and out of her house all day long, every day. I don't think that happened. I assume that these men were coming there for a reason. And I don't think it would have been just to watch Joseph and Sydney do the translation of the Bible. You know, although maybe, maybe it was an open door, you know, sort of like when you go to a restaurant, you get to watch the chefs sometimes do their cooking. I, I always like that. So maybe they just wanted to watch them do the translation. I don't know. But um, I'm wondering if perhaps their day included two things and the men were gathering for another meeting. But there were men in the room. And Philo Dibble, by the way, is writing this down after the fact for several years. And he has different accounts and they do not correlate exactly just like it is with most of our memories. He says here, but usually when things don't, aren't exactly right, um, we say it's more accurate as a historian because they're not copying from the other one. They're just using their memory. But anyway, um, during the time that Joseph and Sidney were in the spirit and saw the heavens open, there were other men in the room, perhaps 12, and among whom I was one during part of the time, probably two thirds of the time. And I saw the glory and felt the power, but did not see the vision. So he can see and feel the glory of God without seeing or hearing the word of God and the person of our Savior. He continues on. 
during the whole time, not a word was spoken by another person, not a sound or emotion made, anyone but Joseph and Sydney. And it seemed to me that they never moved a joint or limb during the time that I was there. And I think it was over an hour and to the end of the vision. Now, this is um, what would happen according to the accounts. One would say, what do I see? And then they'd describe it. And then, then the other one would say, I see the same. And then someone else, Sydney would say, what do I see? And describe it. And then Joseph would say, I see the same. Philo remarked that Joseph sat firmly and calmly the entire time in the midst of that magnificent glory. And then he said, but Sydney sat limp and pale, apparently as limber as a rag, observing which Joseph remarks smilingly, Sydney is not as used to this as I am. I appreciate that little side note to see a little bit of Joseph's humor, his personality, and also to see the humble meekness of his voice. Um, and in this vision, which we are going to just deal with the hard questions, but you know they talk about Lucifer's fall. And this doctrine was not understood, is not understood by most of the world's religions. And this is new to Joseph. This is one of the unique doctrines that came to pass. Um, the idea of two resurrections is new. The idea of, of three kingdoms of glory after the resurrection is new. However, there was a lot of discussion on these things because it's in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, my favorite chapter on the resurrection, the best chapter in the New Testament on the resurrection right here, 1 Corinthians 15. Verses 40 to 42, there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. And there is one glory for the sun and another glory for the moon and another glory for the stars and one star different from another star in glory. And so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption and is raised in incorruption. Now, you may think it's right here. Joseph is just copying Paul. He's just adding on Paul. There's nothing new that Joseph's adding. Well, that is because you are defining Paul, or you, whoever has the question, I didn't mean to be uh, mean there, uh, is defining their questions the way they are interpreting 1 Corinthians. That is not the way 1 Corinthians was interpreted by the 19th century, and I will show you some examples in a minute. But again, in 2 Corinthians, Paul refers to himself in third person, chapter 12, verse 3 and 4, where he says, I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was snatched up into the third heaven and heard things that are not to be told that no mortal is permitted to repeat. And Joseph later said that Paul and all the apostles had received their endowment and taught from that perspective, that they had received their temple ordinances, their initiations, as well as their sealings. And hence, we assume that this may be what Paul was referring to. In 2011, there was this online. What did St. Paul mean by the third heaven? And does that mean that there are three heavens? And here's the online Google knows everything answer. The third heaven replaced the word paradise. In the days of St. Paul, the space between ourselves and the stars was viewed as the first heaven, and the space that contains the stars and the planets was viewed as the second heaven. And these two areas where God dwelt was paradise, and it was viewed as the third heaven. So that is the way it's answered online now. But the truth is, death was a common topic in the 19th century. Remember, in 1800, 46% of the people born died before their fifth birthday. And the average lifespan, because there was this great death in the early ages, the average lifespan is only 40 years old. And so the Lord has something else. I mean, the people had this question and the, the Lord's words were interpreted differently. Catholics believed that there were three, just like Peter said, but it's different. There's hell, there's hell, purgatory, and then heaven. And the Protestants said, no, the elect those who God has foreordained, those who God has chosen to be righteous will go to heaven and the others will all be damned. And it's God's choice and he is making them damned is what their literature says. Hopefully that is not what many people who believe say. But Joseph, Joseph said, that is not my definition of election. All can be elect. Election is for all who choose to be worthy, who choose to follow God. Now, at the time of Joseph's writing, the Universalist Church, as you recall, that was the church of his, his father and his grandfather and many of his uncles up in Vermont, um, stated that 
in the afterlife, Christ will redeem all people after a period when he punishes the sinners. So there's good and bad. This is Alexander Campbell, of course, um, our, our friend that th about half of the church in 1831 were um, former members of the Campbellite congregation. He taught that there one differed from the next as the sun to the excelled a star. So he's quoting from Paul there. He believes there's kingdoms of mortality that were on birth. We're kingdom of the law. That's when we're born. And then after we're baptized, we join the kingdom of favor. And then when we die, we go into the kingdom of glory. And that comes only through our good works. That's what he was preaching, the three degrees of glory. Two were on earth, and then there's heaven for the good folks. Now, Emanuel Swedenborg never lived in the United States, uh, never published um, things that were readily available to Joseph, but his writings were in the United States because he's, he's early. Um, and he taught that there were th heaven was in three areas. There's the natural state, the spiritual state, and the celestial state, also building off of Paul's writing in the Bible. So by saying Joseph is just copying from Paul, it does not expand the 2,700 words that Joseph uses in addition to what Paul has said. Um, and he adds over 100 verses on this in our scriptures. But the word that I would like to talk the most about today is his use of the Holy Spirit of promise, this sacred, wonderful blessing of the gift of the Spirit. It is a function of the Spirit that is used just as the Spirit has a function as a witness and as a comforter. He also is, it is his role to act as the Holy Spirit of promise, to sanctify and, and seal our ordinances. Section 54 is the first time it's mentioned. Sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Can you zoom in there? I've got it in the blue box there. Can you read his handwriting? Sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. And then look down to all these other references. They're just beautiful. For those who will be the church of the firstborn, they will be the priests and the kings of glory and fulfilling God's laws for them. This is just beautiful. And he is referring to a type of the Holy Spirit of promise that we do not often refer to. He is not referring to the sealing of our baptism. He is referring to our calling and election. The only other time this phrase is used is in the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. And in the King James Version, Ephesians 1.13 reads, After that, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also is after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. That's all we have. But we do have the idea in Peter and the idea in um, um, Acts, which is also um, Luke, um, Luke's writing, where we refer to these ideas of a sealing and promises of one's calling and election that are combined. And so we have this idea percolating out of the Bible into Christianity over the centuries that left a spectrum of where election fell and who are going to be given these promised sealings and who are not. And on one extreme, we have the Reformed faiths of Presbyterian, the many Protestant faiths who have a Calvinistic base, believe that only either 144,000 will be saved as a literal number rather than a symbolic number, or a set group of people that are called the elect. Um, and then in the middle of that spectrum, the disciples of, of, of Christ, which was a later name for Alexander Campbell's congregations, the Armenians, the Methodists, believe, no, um, you can choose to obey come unto Christ, and, and it depends on your actions whether or not you can receive a witness of the Spirit and be saved by, by His grace. And then we have people like Charles Finney, who's a little bit um, even further out there, and then finally Joseph Smith on the opposite end that says, actually, you have complete autonomy on whether or not you will come to Christ and whether or not you can receive the Spirit. The Lord wants everyone to. It is not limited. But what did they interpret it meaning sealed with the Holy Spirit? This comes out of Charles Hodge. I mentioned him in many previous weeks as the leading theologian of the 19th century. And so I go to him first because I know that his statements have filtered through um, most congregations across um, the East Coast of the United States and many of the Western movement by the time of Joseph's writings. Quote, it renders their salvation certain. This sealing is by the Holy Spirit of promise. That is the Spirit 
who was promised or who comes in virtue of the promise. So he goes on after this to say, Jesus promised that he would send the Holy Spirit. And when the Spirit came, that is the promise fulfilled, the virtue fulfilled that was promised. So he is using it as not a title, not an idiom, not a five word phrase like Joseph does, but as the promise that Christ said, the Spirit will come. And that is exactly how it was used by most people. Alexander Campbell, a prolific writer, also included some thoughts on the Holy Spirit of promise. It's wonderful when I can find things in, in, by Alexander Campbell, since so many of the members of our church already had this in their background, but they defined it differently. This is how Alexander defined it initially, that all the believers, after believing the gospel, are sealed by the Holy Spirit. That is a seal or impression of the Spirit on their soul. And look how he spelled soul. Isn't that interesting? It was an earnest pledge until they enter into the enjoyment of the inheritance of the saints. That this seal is as sufficient guarantee or earnest and requires not any external ordinance to perfect it. That's where we differ. That's where Joseph was completely unique. Um, it is different. It is a sealing of the ordinances, in fact. It's exactly the opposite of what he said. It is a ramification that the correct authority, that the correct priesthood, that the correct um, condition of the heart, that the, there's no hypocrisy. God is not going to allow any hypocritical person to be baptized to receive the Holy Spirit of promise in relationship to their sealing of their covenants. So these seven verses in the Doctrine and Covenants that I mixed up before, <laughs> um, as well as six of, no of the sermons in Nauvoo that Joseph gave, all give us more insight on this Holy Spirit of promise. And so even though it's only in section 76 that we're discussing for the Come Follow Me today, I would like to just bridge these sermons and these sections to give you a broader understanding of what it is, because Joseph spoke a lot about it now, and it is um, mentioned in the Encyclopedia of Mormonism. It's mentioned in a few of our um, um, manuals, but it is not frequently used with that title from our general conference reports. But there are so many other titles that mean the same thing, and I do hear them in conference. The Holy Spirit of Promise is used for a conditional promise and a permanent promise. It's the same thing, except for one is a ratification and the other is a promise ceiling that will not be removed. I like to think of it a little bit like a light switch, that it is either the Holy Spirit of promise when we are living worthy of our covenants, of our ordinances, of the way we partake of the sacrament. Sometimes when we partake of the sacrament, the Holy Spirit of promise will ratify that and sanctify that experience to our souls. And other times, it is not. And our thoughts are elsewhere, and it's difficult. And that is one of my favorite things about having home church this year. Um, I am one who, in California, our churches have not been opened, and I have had the sacrament now for a long time at home. But the sealing and the ratification is when it is switched on. This is a, either a permanent seal, or a conditional seal. Now, the word seal in the ancient world, of course, was used with all the documents. You had either the king's seal or somebody's seal from their ring, you know, notifying the leadership, whosoever it was, and you often had one sealed portion, one unsealed portion. Some things were in stone, some things were on paper, some things were in metal, but we have lots and lots of examples. John W. Welch has given us a lot of information on this. But section 76 gives us information in verse 51. They who overcome and are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. They are the church of the firstborn. They are those whose hands the Father has given all things. They are they who are priests and kings who have received the fullness of his glory. And you know, there's a lot about it before as well. Look at the verses before. I just didn't write, type them all in. But I chose to refer to this in this image of crawling through the cross. We have to conform ourselves completely to Christ's requests. We cannot use smorgasbord of, the, of Jesus Christ's commandments that are given in the Doctrine and Covenants. We can't do like William McClellan and say, yeah, sure, I'll go to Missouri on my time schedule. I'm gonna leave my mission early. I'm gonna marry the person I was told not to marry. I'm gonna, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we have to submit our will to the fathers. As our prophet used the word in conference before, 
of humbling ourselves and remembering that we are to always submit to our Savior in any condition. The second place we find this is in section 88, the olive leaf, that wonderful revelation that was given um, in 1832, right after Christmas, after the difficult version scripture on, on the war that was given on Christmas Day, then this came in as the olive leaf. And the Lord repeated the same phrase to Joseph's mind, this title that became a, a name for a certain responsibility a, of the Spirit as his function as a sealer or, um, of ordinances. But we learn something new about it in section 88. He combines it with another comforter. I now send upon you another comforter, even upon you, my friends, that it may abide in your hearts, even the Holy Spirit of promise. So he's relating another comforter to the Holy Spirit of promise. Which other comforter is the same that I promised my disciples, as is recorded in the testimony of John? This comforter is the promise which I give unto you of eternal life, even the glory of the celestial kingdom. Which glory is that of the church of the firstborn, even God, the holiest of all, even the Jesus, the Son of So the Lord is teaching us. This is in our scriptures. He, this, this phrase should be used, familiar with us. And both in section 76 and section 88, he is not referring to the conditional sealing. He is referring to that permanent sealing when you are going to be promised the celestial kingdom, when you are promised through the other comforter, which Joseph talks about in one of his sermons, which I'll get to in a few minutes, um, our members of the church of the firstborn, as our Savior is the firstborn. The third place it's mentioned is in relationship to Hiram, which I just love. Section 124, 124, easy one to memorize. I give unto you, Hiram Smith, to hold the sealing blessings of my church, even the Holy Spirit of promise, whereby ye are sealed up unto the day of redemption, that ye may not fall. He is sealed up to the day of redemption, and it is by the words of the prophet. And in section 132, we learn that all of the permanent sealings need to be done by the prophet. And now we come into section 132. Remember, the first half is introducing eternal marriage, and then the second half of 132 refers to the practice that was revealed that Joseph needed to practice polygamy at that time for a short period of time in conjunction with Jacob chapter 5. But in verse 7, all covenants that are not made and entered into and sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise by he who is anointed... And then he gives a little parenthetical. And I have appointed only my servant Joseph to hold this power in the last days. And there is never but one on the earth at a time on whom this power and the keys of this priesthood are conferred, in parentheses. So he's saying, this is only an ordinance that you're going to get from the prophet. And in our generation, it's the first presidency um, or the, the, the prophet seers and revelators. But it is an ordinance and it's appointed to be given only by one person. At this time, it was the prophet. And for most of the history of the church, it was just the prophet. And then he continues on, sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, are of no efficacy, virtue or force in and after the resurrection of the dead. So any of our ordinances that are not sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise will not become permanent unless we have a sealing, um, whether that's in this life or the next life, it doesn't matter as long as we are saved and clasped in the arms of Jesus. And the majority of them will be given in the next life. But in a few um, months, when I talk about the anointed quorum, we will speak specifically about this in the writings of Joseph Smith that are available online. Section 32, verse 18 continues on. If a man marry a wife and make a covenant with her and is not sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, then it is not valid, neither a force, when they are out of this world. Okay, he's repeated that enough times now. If it is sealed unto them by the Holy Spirit of promise, by him who is anointed, we already went through that in verse 7, unto whom I have appointed this power, then ye shall inherit thrones and kingdoms, principalities and powers, dominions, all heights and depths. And then shall it be written in the Lamb's book of life. That is the promise of the permanent sealing right here in section 132, verse 18 and 19. And then in verse 26, he finishes up, they are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. And if they commit no murder, wherein they shall shed innocent blood, yet they shall come forth in the first resurrection and enter into their exaltation. These references are to the permanent sealing. Now you can also say, no, they can also refer to the conditional. And they can. Our baptisms are sealed. Our um, 
even the non-saving ordinances, I believe the Holy Spirit can be there. And that's why I mentioned the sacrament. But the sealing ordinance that is permanent affects our exaltation, as it says here in verse 28, 26. And this is what refers, Joseph referred to when he talked in Nauvoo in his sermons about becoming an heir with Christ. This is the um, references that have now built up with seven different scriptures in the Doctrine and Covenants. He re- comes to Nauvoo and uses these three or four or five words um, interchangeably. Sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, calling an election, and the more sure word of prophecy. There are others, but the reason why I included these is because each of these phrases are used in the Bible, but they are not defined the same No other Christian faith connects all of them together. I have found many people referring to sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise and a more sure word of prophecy or calling election, but combining all of them in the way that Joseph did to describe the important role of the Spirit to determine authenticity and to ratify that, yes, this was done correctly at the right time in the right place with the right heart. Um, the other phrases that fit into this same synonymous category are entering into the rest of the Lord or joining the church of the firstborn or your second anointing. June 27th, 1839, when the Lord has thoroughly proved him and finds that the man is determined to serve him at all hazards, then the man will find his calling and election made sure. Now, these early sermons in Nauvoo, look at this, June very, very early. Um, They're still intense. Uh, I'm just thrilled that at the time of so much malaria and so much hardship, the Lord emphasizes this hope to strive for it. Don't let the circumstances allow you to, to argue and complain and doubt the prophet and doubt God's revelation and to murmur because of your afflictions. Always keep in your mind that vision of receiving your Holy Spirit of promise sealing or your calling election. Here's another sermon. This is a little bit closer to his death, May 21st, 1843. So this is after the Temple Endowment, after the organization of the Relief Society, which was to prepare priestesses to function in the temple. He starts out in Nauvoo. There are three grand keys to unlock the whole subject. First, what is the knowledge of God? Second, what is it to make our calling election sure? And third, And last, how to make our calling election sure. And then he says, I will give you the answer. It is to obtain a promise from God for myself that I shall have eternal life. That is the more sure word of prophecy. Peter was writing to those of like precious faith with them to the apostles first to be sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's what he's talking about here. That's the goal. We, we can't just think because we are, we made it through our mission. We made it even maybe some of you through your temple endowment, uh, maybe even the ceiling for a few um, that you've made it. That is not how you make it. We make it by striving for this great ordinance that will be given to the majority of us in the next life. Um, this great opportunity to have our calling and lecture made sure. But at the time of Joseph's life, He got around to more people and it was a little bit easier to give. I appreciate this editorial explanation of Brother E. Hatton Cook, who has, who have studied so thoroughly every sermon in every different penmanship by each different scribe, as Joseph spoke extemporaneously through those four years in Nauvoo. In a certain limited sense that Joseph Smith used many times, the phrase Holy Spirit of promise has reference to the concept of making your calling and election sure or being sealed up to eternal life. Thus, when the Holy Spirit of promise receives authorization from Jesus Christ to unmistakably seal the promise of eternal life on a worthy individual, he is placing the seals on the highest gospel ordinances in his office as Holy Spirit of promise. So as we look at all the wonderful things that the Holy Ghost does for us, from witnessing of truth, from providing joy and happiness and love, from giving us the gift of the spirits of healing and testimony and faith, of hope, of sealing our ordinances. The final 
thing the Holy Spirit does for those of us during mortality who have strived to live the commandments of God and who have entered into the covenants with our Savior through the ordinances is to have those sealed. Theologically, this is fascinating. The Holy Spirit of promise includes doctrines of our Savior's grace. It is available for all. It is, the, it is not just the elect whom God deemed prior to their creation on, as babies on earth. It is God's grace. The atonement is not limited. The atonement is available for all of us. His atonement covers the blood and sins of this world, and we can receive it through repentance. The Spirit's endorsement that the Spirit is around us, that the Spirit of the Lord is a guide in our life, that priesthood authority has been restored and is functioning and only functions when we have the keys from God's one anointed down through the channels of priesthood authority. And who is determined whether or not that priesthood bearer is worthy? It is the Holy Spirit of promise. And so in case anyone has ever received a piece of bread from someone who was not perhaps worthy to pass it at that time, if you are worthy, the Holy Spirit of promise knows your heart and you will be blessed for it. Our human desires and our actions um, make up the difference between whether or not we are going to be able to receive this affirmation of our covenants. And every day as we repent, and every hour when it's needed, um, we can pray that the Spirit return to our lives as we offend it with an unkind word or a bad thought and place ourselves back to the role of sanctification by the Spirit. Joseph also put in the word, the, I mean, the, the, the title, the Holy Spirit of Promise, when he was doing the Joseph Smith translation of First John. So remember, he's receiving section 76 in John chapter 5, and he goes all the way through to the epistles, all the way down to the very, very end with John's first epistle, and he changes and adds it, whoever is born of God doth not commit sin, but continue in sin. So he's saying, no, we all commit sin. Even if we've been born of God, we're going to fall again, but we don't continue in it. We have the ability to stop, to recognize it, to say, you know what? I blew it. And the faster we turn around, the closer we are to the Savior. I, I, my husband is so good about apologizing. I think that's one of the greatest things in our marriage is the immediacy of apology um, to, to heal. It's so nice to say, I wish I wouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. That is not really the way I feel. Let's, let's, let's try that again. Um, we do not continue in sin because we can recognize the difference between good and evil. That's why we're put on earth to recognize between good and evil by ourselves. And then continuing on, it used to say, for he who is born of God doth not sin for his seed. And Joseph changes that and says, for the spirit of God remaineth in him. That's how we don't continue in sin. If the spirit's there, the spirit is the cleansing power. Remember Joseph Smith said, you might as well baptize a bake of sand as baptize someone without giving them the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is exactly what this is talking about. This Joseph Smith translation is way before, he's given way before Joseph gave that in a sermon. The message is the spirit is the cleansing power. It is the spirit that takes Christ's atoning sacrifice and applies it to our life. It is the spirit. When we feel the spirit, we know we are cleansed. Christ's cleansing, atoning sacrifice is enabling us to be purified. It is the Spirit of God that allows us to not continue in sin. The Spirit of God then can remain in us because the Spirit cannot continue in sin because he is born of God or the, the person cannot continue in sin because he's born in God. Having received the Holy Spirit of promise, that one can be used conditionally or unconditionally, permanently. I don't know how we want to interpret that one. But Joseph's view of the calling and election is something that he wanted the saints to strive for. He spoke about it a lot. He uses all these different words, whether it's the rest of the Lord or the Holy Spirit of promise. Um, he is meaning the same thing. He wants to take the saints back into the presence of the Lord. He wants us to be able to partake of the tree of life without our sins. 
And we need the Spirit's cleansing to do that. And when a person has gone through enough trials in life, they will receive that blessing through an ordinance, probably in the next life. But in the early church, it was given by Joseph to many. We can choose to be chosen. We can choose our lifestyle. We can choose the condition of our heart. We come in these bodies, you know, we come with all of our warts and our challenges, but we can choose whom we want to worship. And section 76 opens up that beautiful vision that all can receive the desires of their heart. Every person that has the greatest desires, it will come to pass. If your desire is a telestial desire, you will receive it because your actions follow your desires. God is in control, but God does not control humans. And I believe that we have greater power to control our thoughts than we realized. At the end of section 76, we're still in March of 1832. We're still up in John Johnson's farm. Emma is just expecting um, Joseph Smith III. She's pregnant in her first trisemester. Right after this vision is when Joseph is tarred and feathered. Later, Joseph dies. And then shortly after that, a few days after that, um, he leaves for Missouri to make that 800 plus mile journey. After this enormous vision, the reality of life sets in and so hard. I do want to give you this little bit of feedback though on the location, just for archaeologists on this uh, topic. As you read the story of the tar and feathering, um, when they came in on that miserable, cold, icy March night of 1832 into Joseph's house and Sydney's little barn and to tar and feather them as the mob comes in, um, they are not in their bedroom. The twins have measles. And I told you Emma had been trained in the medical world when we talked about Emma in, in section 25, the 11th, come follow me. And they had moved into the kitchen because Emma wanted to always have boiling water and keep everything very, very warm. And so they're in there. And that's how when the mob comes in through that back door, they get Joseph immediately. They have moved their bed into the kitchen to sleep with the boiling water for the measles and to keep the moisture there. And um, that's um, an archaeological evidence of the way things take place that, again, adds one more layer. These are not made up stories. We have witness after witness. And the tar and feathering was absolutely awful. I'm sure you've heard the stories of Joseph being choked unconscious and Sidney's head is dragged across the ice and um, they break one of Joseph's teeth while he's trying to pour in poison and um, of course, the flesh is all lacerated. The guy jumps on him and said, this is how the Holy Ghost jumps on you. And, and then they pour the tar all over this scratched naked body and um, they stuff it in his mouth and Joseph can't breathe and he has to pull the tar off his mouth when they finally leave and they're going to kill him. And, and somebody says, don't, and they leave. Then they cover him. You know, it's just awful. And, jo and, and Joseph at least is able to walk back. And of course, Emma faints. She thinks that he's covered with blood or something's worse. And Sydney is still unconscious. And Sydney never fully recovers. I have so much empathy for Sydney. As you read the early descriptions of Sydney's personality, I personally wonder if maybe he would be um, labeled or diagnosed as bipolar. And I don't know if it was after this incident or before, but many of his actions and behaviors and thoughts and the things that he writes would um, lead one to possibly go down that road. I don't want to throw stones at anybody. I feel that um, the Lord uses all of us wherever he can, but Sydney never fully recovers from this and it has, has problems um, after this. So why would the Lord allow this to happen? This is days after the vision. Well, it's a month after the vision. I, anytime something bad happens, don't ask why me. We'll follow Elder Maxwell's advice and say, what can I learn? And the thing that I learned from this is how Joseph, you know, Sister Johnson, Elsa came in that night and put lard in his head and started peeling out all the um, tar, uh, pulling it out of his hair. And, and Emma, of course, with, with the twins in so much need, called in others to help so that she could peel off. He, he has third degree burns all over his body. I told you I'm a nurse. I know what third degree burns are. He is in excruciating pain, and yet we're told the next morning he gets up and he records 
with my flesh all scarified and defaced, I preach to the congregation as usual. And in the afternoon, baptized three. He also says that he saw members of the mob and whose voices he recognized and names he heard in the congregation. And his heart is filled with forgiveness and he preaches with the spirit. He does not hold anger. He does not hold them responsible at that time. He lets the spirit enter into his heart. He forgives and moves ahead. And then within a week, the baby dies. They've ordered the paper in Virginia and he heads off. Uh, oh, no, it's in West Virginia now, but that's right where the star is. That's where I've got it. That's where Whitting is. If you don't want to look it up, Wheeling is, I mean, excuse me, and heads off. But next week, we'll talk about section 77, which is the keys to the book of Revelation, which is just what we need to know at this day and age when the second coming is on the cusp and so much of the Doctrine and Covenants refers to the time of the coming of the Savior. It was on everyone's mind, the building of Zion, the building of Missouri. I feel like we have got to understand section 77 to understand the early saints. But my heart goes out to all of them. They suffered far more than I can ever imagine. And when I look at my trials and the things that dissuade us from the church, it is pale in comparison to what the early saints suffered. I believe that Joseph was a prophet of God and that he saw the vision and other visions and if you want a list of all of them, go read Alex Baugh's article in BYU Studies. But the visions and the church of Joseph's um, revelations are not under his direction. All of them are under God's direction. It is not Joseph's church. It was not Joseph's revelations. It is our Savior's revelations. And we follow him and we worship him. And we strive to receive the sealing power of the Holy Spirit of promise permanently. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.